What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer, looking through the Zoom technology at Tori McElhaney and Ashton Edmonds, coming to you after another unwelcome result in, let's be honest, a series of them. The latest, which came on Sunday of Week 15, was a 21-18 to victory by the rival New Orleans Saints over the Falcons. And this was yet another one that comes down to the wire. Uh, Tori McElhinney and I were joking on Saturday that we weren't sure what was going to happen, but we were pretty sure it was going to end with a three-point swing either way. Um, It always does. (laughs) Yeah, we got that part right. And again, unfortunately for the Falcons, um, it doesn't end well for them. They now fall to five and nine. But just because of this result doesn't mean that there's nothing to talk about. In fact, there's quite a bit. Because this was a lot to talk about. Absolutely. This is Desmond Ritter's a lot. This is Desmond Ritter's NFL debut. We have Tyler Algier going full on beast mode. Um, We have another disappointing result and we have a weird wild. Will this ever end with a victor NFC South where Tampa Bay loses, Carolina loses, Atlanta loses. The Saints win. Everybody's bunched together uh, in a confusing and absolutely maddening way that I don't really think is, I mean, it's, I don't even know if it's entertaining. It's kind of just become sad a little bit. Um, It it, it is one of those things that I think it has become, it's taken on a life of its own and I don't know if I like it. It, it, It's like, it makes it fun. And I feel like I've talked about this before where I love it when, you know, NFL teams are kind of all on the same level. I think that's when you have like the most fun games league wide. I mean, we just saw on Sunday, how many over over the course of this week, 15, how many games like took a last second swing (laughs) or a significant comeback or anything like that. The NFL is at its best when kind of everybody's on the same level, I think, but the NFC South right now is just bonkers. It's yeah. really wild to sit and think about all the different outcomes that we could have in the next three weeks. Right. But none of them matter until the Falcons figure out themselves. Right. So right. this is going to be an inward looking podcast. Almost all the time we get to the end of it and we say, what's the state of the NFC South? Well, the state of the NFC South is that Tampa Bay leads it at six and eight. Every other team is five and nine, but it doesn't matter that Atlanta's on the bottom. It wouldn't matter if Atlanta was in second place. What matters is that they are not doing enough good things and not are not putting together a complete enough performance to come out of these games with a victory. They've lost uh, too many in a row. They've lost too many in a cluster. Uh, Tori, what did you say? Five of six? I think it's six of seven now. Six of I think seven. it was five of I think it was five of six before we went into the bye week. Well, don't quote me on that. Right. But but <laughs> we're going to go ahead and focus inward about what the Falcons did, about how Desmond Ritter and Tyler Algier and the defense did, uh, and where the Falcons go from here, more than let's try to figure out some mathematical tiebreakers in a way that the Falcons can still win the NFC South. That's for only if they get on the winning track and finish really strong um, and perform better in close games than they have recently. Before we get to all that big picture type of stuff, before we break down Desmond Ritter's debut, this was one of those situations, Tori, where they were down 14 to nothing early. Then it was 14-3 at half. Then they came storming right back, ultimately fell just short. What what did you make of this Falcons-Saints installment on its own? I think that when I go back and look at this game, what will stick out to me will be that it's kind of fall. It followed similar patterns to what we have seen this Falcons team be in 2022. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have a bend, but don't break defense. You know, the, it looked like the defense was breaking at the very, very beginning of the game. You know, like it, it didn't look good. I think all of the defenders in that locker room would tell you that their start was not what it needed to be. But then you look at what the offense was doing and the run game was so, so productive and you have over 200 rushing yards. And this is now how many games that they have had over 200 rushing yards and not actually won the game. That is 
we know what this run game is. We know how good it can be. And the fact that the pass game is not catching up to the production of the run game continues to be something that I think we talk about week in and week out. And I tried to like say this throughout the week that just because Desmond Ritter was starting didn't mean that that was automatically going to fix. It's like the problem that they have in the past game and the lack of execution that they have in the past game. That's a lot of pressure to put on one person. Um, it, it's, it, I think it's a collective um, issue that the Falcons have had from the beginning of this season to where we are now. We're now in week 15. Week, week 15 has just ended. We're going into week 16 of the 2022 season, and this has been a consistent talking point, I think, of what we've had to talk about, about this offense, particularly as we've gone through this season. Ashton, why are the Falcons struggling in one-score games? Man, honestly, I think I look at the first quarter, um, Saints scored twice in under six minutes. I think that was that's big. I, the defense gave up two critical touchdowns and you can't let a team get a lead that early into the game like it was in the first quarter um and I think that really hurt them early on I, I definitely think the defense held their own in the second half um which they played really well they were really solid but I think that first half start is what really hurt the Falcons early on they just they couldn't find a rhythm they were giving up way too much chunk yardage um, the the secondary was getting beat left and right. And I think that's something that they really had to hone in on. But I would say what really hurt the Falcons, in my opinion, was that how the, the Saints really got off to a fast start and scored two touchdowns in under six minutes. Yeah, look, last year they were 7-2 and two in one-score games. This year the record is a lot worse. Um, it's mostly been coming close after early deficits, like Ashton pointed out, and kind of not being able to finish the job that they kind of chip away, chip away, chip away, and can't really seal the deal. They've done so a couple times, and those have been fun wins to watch. I think more more often than not, it hasn't gone that way. And something that I feel like Tori and I have been screaming for the last 12 months is that the the performance in one score games doesn't travel right? Like there's too yeah. much randomness to assume that that can be like a foundational quality of your team with the exception of if you got a Brady Rogers Manning esque person at the helm, right? That that's right. like the, that, that's the I before E except after C type of situation. Um, but they haven't done well enough. They, they are getting into early deficits. They are battling all the resiliency, the, the, the fighters, the lots of things that we know about this team but just quite not quite good enough to get over the hump. And I think Tori mm -hmm. brings up a good point that inserting a 20, an early 20 something year old in Desmond Ritter wasn't going to magically solve all of their problems. When I think a lot of people maybe unspokenly thought that, that they thought, well, there's a lot of critical mistakes that we can pin on the quarterback. If we get a new quarterback, those like those mistakes won't happen. And if we were going from veteran to veteran, maybe that's one thing, but we're going from a veteran who, you know, what you have versus an unknown commodity, an asset where it's his first NFL game and there's so much to adapt to. So Tori. Yeah. And also yeah. like he, I mean, he's a third round pick too. You know, right. it's not like we're talking about a first round pick in the 2022 NFL draft. It's not like we're talking about the expectations that were put on like Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson, or even Justin Fields in their first years. Like I feel like Desmond Ritter's trajectory has to be looked at through a different lens because there's a reason why some people don't get drafted in the first round, you know, like it's, it's not like this is all like, Oh, like he fell all that way. Like there's a reason why guys are taken when they're taken. And so I think you have to think about that too, when you're watching a guy who hasn't taken a true live snap since August. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So let's just look at the stat sheet. Not that it means a whole lot. And then Tori, we're going to let you break this down because you talked to Arthur Smith, to Desmond Ritter, to several people about Desmond Ritter and his NFL debut. Desmond Ritter, 13 completions of 26 attempts, 97 yards, a 59.3 passer rating, six carries, 38 yards uh, with a long of 18. The stat sheet doesn't inspire confidence, but I can tell you, I can promise you one thing. 
that we're going to do over the course of the next four final whistle podcasts, I guess, including this one is we're going to look at the stats because they're there for us, Mm -hmm. but we're not going to stop there. This is about the eye test. This is about the ear test for us as, as journalists. What are the experts saying around us? What are they seeing? And what are we seeing as we use a fine tooth comb to try to dissect and find little moments of positivity or negativity about Desmond Ritter's performance beyond the box score. Tori, give us a synopsis of what you wrote about and what uh, the Falcons said about Desmond Ritter after his NFL debut. Yeah, I think it starts off with what Arthur Smith was talking about, where he made the comment to Desmond Ritter on Saturday before he'd ever taken a snap on Sunday and he made the comment to Desmond Ritter and told him look like it doesn't matter if you go out and throw for 400 yards or 100 yards against the Saints that's not going to define your career and I I say that because I want people to understand that this these next four games include including the game that was just played the Saints game it's to me, I look at it more as an evaluation period to decide what direction you want to go in 2023. I know that people are like, oh, like we're playing for wins and everything like that. And yes, you still are because yeah, you're still in it. But I I need to be able to see if there's something that can be built moving forward, really thinking about big picture stuff. And so with that in mind, I thought what Arthur Smith and Desmond Ritter both said, and not just them, but Chris Lindstrom as well, was that Desmond Ritter excels in all of the pre-snap stuff. So like getting the call in, getting everybody set, everybody understands what the call is, everybody knows the timing, he's not running out of time with the, the play clock, like all of those things. He commands the offense very, very well. That's something that they talked about, gosh, even back in rookie mini camp, even back during training camp, that this is a guy who mentally understands leadership and what he needs to do as a quarterback in this role. So I say that to say that I was actually very pleased with, I agreed with what Desmond Ritter and and Arthur Smith said about his command of the offense and Something that was really interesting when I was looking back at it, the Falcons actually weren't penalized a lot in this game against the Saints, like hardly at all. They only had three penalties. There's a very, very few (laughs) penalties thrown or penalty flags. (laughs) I apparently can't (laughs) talk. Penalty flags Um, thrown. Penalty flags thrown. Okay. All of them, those three, not a single one of them were based in procedural penalties by the Falcons offense. And to do that as a rookie quarterback in your first start, and not just that, but in New Orleans was, I think, very impressive to me. But even in that, it's like, okay, so pre-snap stuff is there. The leadership stuff is there. The intangibles are there. But then Desmond Ritter said, he was like, I wasn't executing in the past game. And that's true. We can look at the stats and see that. We can watch the game and see that. There just wasn't execution there. And I think a lot of it, did have to do with Ritter being in his first start. I feel like every quote unquote mistake that he made was a typical rookie quarterback mistake. And that's not me like giving him an out or anything. It's just kind of what I see. And I I think too, it it was interesting kind of hearing Desmond Ritter talk about it as well. When he was like, yeah, it says I would give myself a C minus or a D. I thought I was really good in the pre-snap stuff, but post-snap, I was, that was where the execution kind of fell apart. So I, I say all of that and I don't know, I feel like I'm, I feel like people are going to be like, oh, you're making excuses and and everything. But I I said all week long, like, it's not fair to say that Desmond Ritter is going to come in and completely change the way this offense operates and that he's the savior of Falcons football. It's just not fair to do that at this point in time. What happens over the course of the next three weeks for Desmond Ritter, I think is so important to where the Falcons go in 2023 and 2024. Um, I know that's a big long spiel and I'm sorry if you've made it this far. Thank you for joining me on this segment of Tori Won't Stop Talking. (laughs) Scott, please start talking. (laughs) Ashton, uh, Ashton, what were they saying about Desmond on the broadcast? Honestly, for the most part, they were saying that Desmond was doing really good. Um, I, I know I saw a stat, or not a stat, but I saw like, 
something about how they were kind of comparing quarterbacks who played in New Orleans their rookie years. Um, I think it was they talked about like seven quarterbacks, and I only think two of those quarterbacks, including uh, Robert Griffin, uh, won in New Orleans their rookie season. Um, so they were basically saying that playing in New Orleans is, is a very tough and hostile environment and that Desmond ha handled everything really well. Um, I think over the course of the game, he did handle everything really well. Um, like those first deep balls that he threw in like the first quarter. And he talked about it in his post game presser, like Tori said, he was, you know, trying to be perfect, might have been a little nervous. But I think as over the course as the game went on, you could start to see his confidence and his uh, com comfortability within the offense. Um, and I feel like he did really good in his first NFL start. Um, these last three games will be critical for him. Um, but I think after he goes back, watches the film and see what mistakes he can capitalize on, I think uh, he's going to do really well in these last few games. Yeah, I I look at it and you could see there were, there were times where he was a bit hesitant, right? And I go yeah. back to what Tori said about the mistakes that were made were mistakes that rookies make, right? There were on two instances where there were two near interceptions. And there was another example where he just didn't see the guy coming, right? He, that, right. that some, that the NFL defensive backs and linebackers are very good at making somebody seem open, but they're really not. Right. And I right. think that Desmond fell victim to that a couple of times as people are known to do who haven't played in a game for three months and are playing at this level for the first time. Again, right. I agree with you. Somebody, I guarantee you will show up in the YouTube comments and be like 98 passing yards or 97 passing yards. The end. He was terrible. Okay. And you are allowed and entitled to that opinion. That's fine. He played a part in this loss. No doubt about it. But I think that what I said at the top of the Ritter conversation is that we're trying to bring a nuanced outlook to it, right? And if this is our baseline and this is our this is exhibit A, what's going to happen in exhibit B? I think Arthur Smith even said, look, he's got a big challenge. It's going to be cold yeah. in Baltimore. Lamar Jackson's coming back. The Ravens are desperate and it's on a short week. Right. That's a lot of challenges, but he said that's a good challenge because he wants to see little subtle signs of progress, little subtle signs of progression or regression. Well, we can't have any of those things because this is our first example. So that's what we're trying to look at here. I agree he was too amped up. I, Arthur Smith said that plainly. I, I think that that was evident. The guy's got a fastball. The guy's got a cannon. Uh, maybe we could see some more loft. Maybe we could see some more touch and some more decisiveness, but that's us being nitpicky. The bottom line is the passing game's efficiency didn't improve enough to beat the Saints. The, mm -hmm. the defense allowed 21 points. As I always bring this up, Charles Woodson told me if it's 24 or less, that's all the defense can do. 231 rushing yards. What else mm -hmm. do you want? Tyler Algier, right. who, who we're going to get to. But it's also about Desmond Ritter's candor. And Desmond Ritter's understanding that it wasn't too big for him. Tori and I were walking up to the press box across the field and Desmond was running by himself and he did not look straight. He, he gave us the uh, dual piece. This sign. is pregame, by the way. Pregame. This he is pregame. Yeah. He was totally comfortable. Afterward, he was honest in his assessment. If he gives yeah. you a bunch of coach speak or quarterback speak, player speak, or he thinks he did better than he did, those are warning signs. Instead, you have offensive linemen with good reviews saying that, that the communication and the assignments were clear. The pregame operation was good. What we need to see improvement on is post-snap execution, identifying the right guy, and be, being confident that you've identified him. There's plenty on this tape to coach, and I think that those are positives because – this is a four game evaluation. This is not a decision of whether he sucks or he's great based upon four quarters of football. As Ashton pointed out in new Orleans, it got up to 120 decibels there. We know cause they kept bringing up that meter constantly <laughs> during the game back and forth, back and, and forth. It's an open air press box. Like we don't have glass in front of us. Like we do at a lot of places. And so it, it really was loud at one point. I think I yelled at Scott, like just not mad, just yelled. Right. And, and, and just yell, but nonetheless, we welcome the comments. If you don't like what we have to say here, comment back and forth. We can engage in a productive keyword, productive dialogue, yeah, uh, because it's going to be important to evaluate where Desmond is. And de did he inspire enough confidence to lower quarterback on the priority list? Let's not forget that yep. quarterback is a priority. 
Uh, I would anticipate, I guys, I don't think it's inaccurate or unfair to say I would not anticipate Marcus Mariota being on this roster next, next year, despite his contract status running through the 2023 season. At some point, mm-hmm. you're going to have to add through the draft, through free agency, through a trade. How much yep. are you paying versus be, that will tell us more than anything that said in front of a microphone, what Terry and Arthur and Kyle Smith and Falcons brass think about the number 74 overall draft pick. We could go mm-hmm. on all day on this. We're probably going to yep. go on constantly about this, but we, we have three more games, <laughs> right? We have three more games to talk about this and we're going to keep talking about it and we're going to keep learning and our opinions are going to, keep getting refined that's the good thing about a four game period so let's take this as one chapter in four and see what happens from here but we've spent a lot of time on one rookie drafted in the third round let's spend some time on a rookie drafted in the fifth round why don't you hold on Uh, wait before i do have a question i'm so sorry before we move on to a different rookie i do have a question when i was talking about um you know, Desmond, like intangibles, the mentals are there getting the play call in is there maybe not like the physical, physical parts of being able to execute in the past game is not quite there yet. Not on the same page yet. Would you rather, if you're like looking at a rookie quarterback, would you rather the mental part of it be there? Or would you rather have a guy who like has like just these, I don't even, I don't like saying like God given abilities, like to just make things happen, but it it comes at the cost of maybe something else. Do y'all have like a preference on which you would want? Like if you're, you're sitting there and you're like a play caller or you're a developer or a coach, like what would you, what would you rather have? I mean, I'd rather deal with the mental side of it first, but I also think that what you're talking about with, with post snap ex- execution, some of that is mental too. Some of that is mm-hmm. pull the trigger and fire. He's got a quick release. He has a strong arm. There are physical attributes there, but there's that decision-making under fire that I think right. needs to improve. So I'd rather have a professor Peyton Manning type, I think over anything else, but that isn't discounting, I think, the fact that Desmond's got the tools. It's just about using them at the right moments more than anything yeah, else. Yeah, I think I said, I think I wrote something along the lines of, you don't need to change Des- Desmond Ritter. You need to refine him. And right. I think that is where, I think that's where I would leave everybody with this, as we end this Desmond Ritter discussion. I think that's where I would leave everybody is like, Desmond Ritter doesn't need to change who he is. They just need to refine kind of what it is that he's doing so that there is better execution. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a long process. Um, I think, uh, but so let's move on to Tyler Algier Yes, career day very early in his career, but man, (laughs) did he look good or what third and one 43 yards. He had a touchdown. I'm just going to read the stats and then Ashton, you can break down Tyler's performance here. 17 carries 139 yards, 8.2 yards a clip for a rushing offense that was averaging 5.9 yards a carry against a defense that is tough along the front and was loading the box. And somehow Mm -hmm. a rookie from BYU who was a preferred walk-on ran all over that defense. Ashton, what did you see? What did you hear from Tyler and from those Mm -hmm. who talked about him? Look, man, Tyler is honestly one. You can argue that Tyler is one of the best running backs in the NFL. Atlanta has the fourth best rushing offense in the NFL. And Tyler Algier, his production has it plays a big role in that. Um, what we saw today against the Saints, man, he showed up in every way, in every aspect. I think he converted on six or seven first downs. They continue to give Atlanta's offense second chance or, you know, second and, and third chances. But um, he showed up big, not only on the ground, but even in that two-point conversion. Um, that great run. I, great run. Yes, that was a great run. He bounced to the outside and, and extended the ball over the pylon. But I think, like Arthur Smith said, his instincts, um, and he's a he's a very smart player, and he's only a rookie. And I think, you know, down in this, in the future of his career, he's he's going to be one of the best when, when it's all said and done. But I think, um, you know, he's he's definitely a bright spot for Atlanta's offense and just for the team in general. And I think, um, you know, for him to be a fifth rounder, man, I, I don't think anybody expected him to come out the gate like this and, and really, you know, really have this much production. I mean, I think the ringers, Bill Simmons, he said he even said the least covered NFL story this season is Tyler Algier um, being a best running back. <laughs> that might be his opinion, but. That I think this is a story that you know should continue to get more spotlight because he's he's doing amazing as a rookie and I think he's exceeding expectations. 
Yeah, I think Arthur Smith said he's he's a guy that you don't want to keep tackling over and over yeah. and over. He's a volume guy, and yet he was really efficient in 17 carries. I don't know. He just seems to kind of get it as an NFL yeah. runner. I, I'm always more impressed by – you know, we talk about like what, what we like in certain position groups. We want, um, cerebral quarterbacks, right. Who can make the good decisions pre and post snap, uh, an underrated feature that I like, which is always why I loved Levy on bell and his prime is patience, right? It's about knowing, and he was maybe even super patient, but it, it's about knowing when to hit the hole, when to give up on a run and bounce it outside when to make the right choice. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're sitting around waiting. It's just let's pause, let's take a breath and make the right choice. And I think that we're seeing Tyler do that. And then when he makes the right choice, then he's a bowling ball. And that, and that Tori, I think is, is, is fun to watch. And it's been fun to watch him develop. He was inactive in week one and now he's yeah. running for 139. Yeah. That's what's crazy is is kind of how he has, it was like a slow burn almost with Tyler Algier, mm -hmm. where Good, you yeah. you didn't necessarily, you knew that the Falcons drafted him for depth, but if you are talking about this Falcons running back group You're in August, you're talking about Cordero Patterson and Damian Williams. Tyler Algier is kind of there, but it's kind of, he's kind of on the back burner. He's not really the star of the show per se. He was the I don't want to say the one good thing that the Falcons had going from them for them on Sunday but he was the most productive that thing that they had going for them on Sunday against the Saints and something that Desmond Ritter said and I even asked him this question in the middle of the week when we first talked to Desmond on Wednesday before the Saints game and I asked him I was like you know the fact that there's like this old saying that the the best friend of a rookie quarterback is a productive run game and yeah. how that kind of adds a little bit of comfort to Desmond Ritter going out there against the Saints and you know it's not do or die if he can't connect on so many throws well yes they lost the game but you do and then I thought it was interesting how you fast forward that to you think about that conversation on Wednesday and fast forward it to today where Desmond was like Tyler Algier is almost like, and the run game in general, is almost a security for me. Like, I, I don't worry when I'm handing the ball off to Tyler that we're, we're going to get anything less than like five yards. And Arthur Smith kind of said the same thing. He's like, you know, we're, we were running it at a clip of almost six yards a carry. Why would we stop doing that? So I, I, I think Tyler Algier, and not just Tyler Algier, but Cordero Patterson and this offensive line talk about stories that I think a lot of people are missing right now is the improvement of this offensive line as a collective group. I know Desmond Ritter was sacked four times against the saints, but their run blocking just continues to impress me. And I, I do think that there's just a lot, there's a lot to be happy with, with this run game. And I said this after the game, I think I even tweeted it. Like I don't have any issues with the Falcons run game. I need the pass game to catch up to that productivity. Yeah. And that's what I wrote about it is, is that passing efficiency right now is the missing link to their winning formula. It's just not pulling enough weight. It doesn't have to be the second coming of Warren Moon's run and shoot. It doesn't have to be Peyton Manning with crazy hand signals in Omaha <laughs> or the you know second coming of those types of offenses. It, what it does need to do is it needs to be a bit more efficient and play off of how well that they're running and burn right. teams for putting eight and nine people in the box. And let's say the run game doesn't do well enough and you got to hit on a third and seven, then that's what you have to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it says in our script to go defense here. Um, I, I do want to hit on two more things though. One is a rookie and one is Dean Pease at the very end of it, as we kind of wrap this yeah. thing up. Uh, the first is Drake London, right? Drake London had a good day today in terms of, again, if you just look at the box score, you're looking at 11 targets, seven receptions for 70 yards. Um, he also had on fourth and five, say what you will about Desmond Ritter's inefficiencies or the flaws in his game on fourth and five do or die moment. He delivers a perfect strike to Drake yeah. London. That was a clutch read, a clutch throw, a clutch play. And Drake yeah. London gets the ball knocked out of his hands and a lost fumble, a lost opportunity that happened at the Saints 39 yard line. 
then, Mm -hmm. and, and then you got two minutes left and you can, at worst, you can set yourself up in the middle of the field for the most reliable kicker in football outside of Justin Tucker to give young way a chance to at least tie it. Right. That's not what happened. The saints get the ball. Drake London did talk to the media. He easily, when asked for an interview, he could have said, I got to go somewhere else. I have to do it. He could have made up any excuse. He did not do that. He talked two or three separate times. And I want to bring up one quote to you guys. I didn't include it all in my tweet, but I, I think it's important when talking about the fumble one, he brought it up himself. He was mm-hmm. talking about the game and he said that game would have looked a little different. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing right now. That right. game would have looked a, a little bit different if I didn't drop the ball. Right. And mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's an important thing for someone in his position to have to say, um, you know, and basically what he said is on a couple of different, um, occasions, he, he said, we just have to figure out a way to get over, the, over the hump. I don't think my play helped. He got a hand on it. I have to be better with ball security, better situationally and better overall in the game. And then later on, he talked about that same play and he said, I'm not, ge- I'm not going to be at all happy about it. I just sold the game. It's hard. I'm a competitive person. And for me to let the team down and let the fans down, it just sucks. It's a hard Mm -hmm. pill to swallow. That is Mm -hmm. honest truth right after the game. When your emotions are still firing, this guy is a good player. I think he's motivated by these welcome to the NFL moments. He's not a guy that puts the ball on the ground. I thought it was honorable for him to do that. And I don't think this will impact him long-term. I think it's important in these moments. I think it shows maturity for a young player. And now I'm in, Scott never shuts up mode here, Tori, is that um, I think it's important in those moments, right? Fans may not care yeah. if, if, if a guy talks or not, but he stood up there, he owned it. He said how much it bothered him. And I think that those types of things, that's good. It's good professionalism. And you know, it's going to motivate him m- moving forward. He doesn't seem like the type of guy to make the same mistake twice. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's all really good take. And I, you know, we saw you saw, you see glimpses of what Drake London can be. And I think about that catch like right down the sideline, I think when he was cutting back across, I'm not sure. I, I, it all runs together at some point. Was it a one hander? Yeah. 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 That one. That was was Um, was nice. Yeah. You see these moments and then you, but then you see the fumble and I think it's, I, I think you heard it with, I mean, you think about all the people that kind of spoke on camera after the game, it was Desmond Ritter, Drake London, and Tyler Algier, a lot of other guys spoke on camera for sure, but those were the ones that I saw as I was kind of walking around. And those are all rookies. Those are all guys that are going to be here for the next four years. So I think it's important that they do have these welcome to the NFL moments because you do learn something from them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Ashton, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to piggyback off of what you said, Scott, just about his maturity. I think a lot of young, sometimes you can see a lot of young players lash out and, and get mad and be really emotional. But from watching on TV, it seemed like he walked over to the sideline and was just trying to keep his composure. Um, you could tell he was really mad and, and really disappointed in that play. But I think, like you said, his maturity and the way he handled himself after the game speaks volumes about his character and who he is. Yeah. Um, and then one more thing, just, we have only a couple minutes left before zoom Mm -hmm. officially boots us because I'm too cheap for the upgrade. Um, (laughs) is this what happened early in the game? Please go read the statements issued by the Falcons, but, uh, Dean Pease was standing on the field during warmups talking to, uh, someone, there was a collision between him and a player. He was carried off the field in a stretcher taken to a hospital and evaluated, it was a scary moment. Tori and I were on yeah. the field at the time. I didn't see it happen. I don't know if you did, Tori, but nonetheless, it was kind of a scary scene um, more than anything else. I just didn't want this whole podcast to go without us saying how much we like and respect and care about Dean Pease. Part of working for yeah. a team is you really get to know some of these people better in cafeterias totally. and on airplanes and those types of things. It was a scary moment for everybody on the sideline. I thought I thought Frank Bush called a really good game, but it's nice to see Dean Pease was able to come home on the plane mm-hmm. and you you could tell how much he meant to everybody in that moment. Absolutely. Um, and it's great to see that he's going to be okay. It was pretty scary in the moment though. Yeah, it was really scary. And, you know, we send out, you know, 
all all the get well Dean P's vibes that we can because I mean he's a y'all know how I feel about him I did a whole two series podcast three series story just about Dean P's and his 50 year coaching career so you don't you don't need me to go into all of that but it was very scary and just seeing the concern of everybody on the sidelines from Arthur Smith to Terry Fontenot to players to coaches and I think I, I I think the start of the game, I mean, I'm not trying to make an excuse for anybody, but like the start of the game, I can't imagine because of when this happened before the game started, it was like 15 minutes before the game started. This was a very quick process where the Falcons literally had to see Dean Pease get taken off the field into an ambulance. You're having, the coaches are all huddled up trying to figure out, okay, what's, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? And then you have to go out and perform. And that's really, really hard to do. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, as good a news as I think we could have gotten, he was able to come home on the plane with us. And so um, we send all, all the vibes and we're just, I think everybody's just really thankful that it wasn't worse than it was because it was very, very scary when we were kind of just standing there watching him get worked on on the, on the field. Yeah. So uh, for us to be in this um, position, again, best of a kind of bad situation, but I at least just wanted to you know, say what Tori said and just kind of yeah. ex- ex- extend the fact that you guys kind of see him in press conference moments. He's a genuinely good human being um, yes. who his players definitely care about. And uh, again, it was good to see him come home. So yeah, literally zoom is like, shut up, get out have one minute. One <laughs> Maybe minute. Like, uh, right Can we some... stretch it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I, now, now there's no more countdown. I'm officially in panic mode. Rate review, subscribe to the Falcons final to the Falcons audio, to the Atlanta Falcons podcast network. My goodness, get it right, Scott. You got it. I'm so nervous. I'm sweating. Okay. (laughs) All right. But yeah, rate, review, subscribe, and we'll talk to you again next week after the, oh, yeah, on a Monday, the Falcons play the Ravens on Christmas Eve. We're not doing anything on Christmas Day. You guys don't want to listen to that podcast then. We are going to come to you on on Monday morning with all of our hot takes uh, right then and there. Guys, thank you so much. 23 seconds. All right. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.